Welcome to Cold Case Detectives Too Close to Home, a monthly Patreon-sponsored series where we select five Patreon supporters at random and examine cases featuring their hometown. If you'd like to see your hometown featured, you can join us on our Patreon linked below. And now let's dive in with five cases from your hometowns. The mysteries that strike too close to home. Andre Bryant and Monique Rivera. Our first case for this month's Too Close to Home comes from our patron Zuri, who chose the borough of Brooklyn in New York City. Known best for its iconic landmarks, including the Brooklyn Bridge, Brooklyn is the most populous county in the state of New York, and as a result, is brimming with unsolved mysteries. On March 28th, 1989, 25-year-old Monique Rivera took her three sons for a walk in their Brooklyn neighborhood when she encountered two women driving in a car. The vehicle was described as a 1988 or 1989 Burgundy Pontiac Grand Am Sports Edition with tinted windows and possibly Maryland license plates. One of the women was African American around the age of 30 and is said to be heavy set with sunglasses and a dark complexion while the other was described as being lighter skinned, possibly Hispanic or African American, with long red hair. She wore a red leather jacket and white trousers and was thought to be around the age of 22. Both she and her companion were around five foot seven. While it is unknown for certain, Monique may have known these two women from middle school. Regardless, the women chatted away happily to the mother of three and even asked to hold her youngest child, Andre Bryant, who was just one month old. Eventually, the two women persuaded Monique to go shopping with them. The 25-year-old bought herself an outfit from a store named Canadians, while the women bought her a new shirt and a pair of trousers. Upon returning home, Monique told her boyfriend, Timothy Bryant, and his sister that the pair had used fraudulent credit cards to make their purchases, but that she planned to go out with them again the following day. They intended on shopping in White Plains, New York. Timothy's sister, Patricia, agreed to babysit the three children the following day so that Monique could go out. The following day, on March 29th, the women called Monique from a phone box nearby and asked her to come and meet them. They insisted that she bring baby Andre with her, and so Monique obliged, leaving her older sons with Patricia. She was last seen getting into the pair's vehicle outside her apartment at around 2 p.m. The following morning, a passing jogger discovered the body of a young African-American woman in the woods by East Chester Bay near City Island Road in the Bronx. She had been struck on the head and strangled, and it was obvious that she had put up a vicious fight, as she had suffered several bruises and broken fingernails. Investigators were able to determine that this was Monique Rivera when Timothy Bryant placed an advert in the local newspaper a few days later, asking for information as to the whereabouts of his missing girlfriend. At the scene, there was no trace of Andre and no sign of the two unidentified women or their vehicle. A few days after Monique's body was found, a woman identifying herself as Joan Walker called the apartment she shared with Timothy and asked to speak with her. When Joan was told Monique was deceased, she replied that it was impossible because she'd gone shopping with her just a few days before. Joan has never been identified and has never been linked to the case. Her connection with Monique is at this time unclear. It has been suggested that if Monique knew the two women from school, they may have held a grudge, or that perhaps they couldn't obtain a child through the usual legal channels and sought to get one, no matter the cost. It's possible they sold Andre or used him to commit welfare fraud, or even, as suggested by online sleuths, used him to deceive a partner into staying in a failing relationship. Andre has not been seen nor heard from since he went missing, and the two women who befriended Monique have never been identified or come forward. Authorities believe that Andre was sold into an adoption ring, 
but it has also been theorized that his case is linked to the disappearances of two other young boys named Shane Anthony Walker and Christopher Milton Dansby. They both went missing from Harlem Park three months apart in 1989. Both Shane and Christopher were African-American toddlers living in the same apartment building, and they both vanished on a Thursday evening between the hours of 5 and 7 p.m. They have never been seen or heard from since. Andre Bryant was just one month old when he was abducted, and his mother, Monique Rivera, was killed. Their cases are still unsolved. Andre was one foot seven and weighed 10 pounds when he was last seen. He is an African-American male with black hair and brown eyes, and was wearing a gray suit with two horizontal lines, a beige knitted hat and sweater, and white socks. If you have any information on his case, you can contact the New York Police Department at 718-574-1605. Additionally, if you have any information about Christopher Dansby or Shane Walker, you can contact New York Crime Stoppers on 800-577-8477. Sandra Phillips. Our next case location is brought to you by our patron Amy, who chose the city of Swansea in Wales. A popular destination with tourists, Swansea is home to many museums, historic sites, and boasts some of the United Kingdom's most beautiful beaches. It is also the location of one of Britain's most grisly unsolved crimes. It was 2 p.m. on Friday, June 14th, 1985, when Anthony Williams unlocked the front door of Private Shop, a sex shop located on Dilwyn Street. As the area manager, he knew this was very unusual and that the shop should have already been open, but still, he never expected what he found inside. The store's manager, Sandra Phillips, was lying dead on the floor in a pool of blood. Sandra was a 38-year-old mother of four and had been sexually assaulted, beaten, and strangled. Petrol had been poured on her body and around the building, but neither had been set alight. When police arrived on the scene, they noted that the 38-year-old store keys were gone and determined that the murder weapon was a heavy, old-fashioned telephone set. Neither item has ever been located. Just one day later, the police found themselves speaking with a pair of brothers described as being of low intelligence, Wayne Darvel, 22, and Paul, 20. The siblings were known to police because they often committed petty street crimes, but authorities were surprised when Wayne confessed to witnessing his brother carry out Sandra's slaying, especially since there was no forensic evidence on the clothing of either man. While Paul maintained his innocence, Wayne told investigators that he'd stolen a St. Christopher medal from Sandra's body, but Sandra didn't own a St. Christopher medal. Additionally, he showed officers a charity collection box he'd stolen, claiming he'd taken it from private shop, but it had come from another store, and he was also unable to lead police to the murder weapon. Despite all of the discrepancies in the brothers' statements, four days after Sandra's demise, the South Wales police arrested the Darvels and charged them with murder. On June 19th, 1986, the pair were convicted and sentenced to life in prison. It seemed that Sandra's case was closed. However, not everybody was convinced. On March of 1991, the BBC aired a TV show named Rough Justice that threw the entire original investigation into question and cast doubt on the evidence-gathering methods used at the time. This prompted the Devon and Cornwall police to step in and investigate, where they found that a number of unethical and illegal practices had been carried out by the South Wales police. According to the findings, Wayne had been bullied into making a statement which implicated himself and his brother in the crime, and testing of the notebooks belonging to detectives found that many of their notes had been made at much later dates than they'd originally claimed. In one instance, an investigator said they'd written their notes immediately following an interview, but it was found that the notebook he had used hadn't been issued until two months after the interview took place. Worse still, the prosecution had joined the police in suppressing evidence, including a bloody palm print which didn't match either of the Darvel brothers, and photos and negatives of the palm prints were later destroyed. 
Several detectives who claimed to have seen the brothers near the store at the time of the murder were also proved to be lying when it was shown that they were elsewhere at the time and couldn't possibly have seen the siblings. Additionally, one of Wayne's former teachers explained that he was a serial confessor, somebody who admitted to being responsible for everything, even when he wasn't. In 1992, the Court of Appeal in London quashed the pair's convictions and released them. They were each awarded £80,000 in compensation for the seven years they'd spent behind bars. Two years later, three South Wales police detectives were charged with conspiracy to pervert the course of justice following their parts in the original investigation. They allegedly forged notes and gave false statements which led directly to the conviction and imprisonment of innocent men. However, following an 11-day trial, all three were found not guilty. The case was reopened in the early 2000s, and in 2002, it was being run by Albert Kirby, who ran the James Bulger investigation. That same year, the media learned of a strong suspect in Sandra's case, who died seven years earlier after serving a lengthy sentence for brutally assaulting a woman. While there was some talk that the man's remains would be dug up so his DNA could be taken and compared with forensic evidence, it appears that this never occurred. A few years later, in 2005, Detectives thought that a false wall installed after the murder may be the clue needed to crack the case wide open, as they thought they would be able to collect DNA from behind it. However, it is unclear of what became of this lead. Sandra's case was closed again in 2009, as there were no new leads to follow and nothing further for forensics to examine. Despite police shifting through hundreds of boxes of evidence, there was nothing that was able to lead them to a resolution. In March of 2005, Paul Darvel was found dead, though his death was ruled as being not suspicious. He was just 42 years old. There are few theories in Sandra's case, with the main one being that the South Wales police were covering up a crime committed by one of their own officers. As of 2021, updates in the case are practically non-existent. If you have any information about the slaying of Sandra Phillips, you can call UK Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 111. Nancy Lewis. Moving on to our third case. This one is from an anonymous patron who chose the city of Birmingham, Alabama as their location. Beginning as an industrial and transportation center, Birmingham flourished following the Civil War and is now notable for its tourism and lush mountain parks. It is home to some of Alabama's most puzzling cold cases. Born on September 14th, 1958, little is documented online about Nancy Lewis's early life. In fact, articles on her case are generally few and far between. This has largely been put down to two reasons. The first is that she is a woman of color, and the second, because her disappearance was overshadowed by that of Natalie Holloway, another woman from Alabama who vanished almost two weeks after Nancy did. 46-year-old Nancy was last seen at around 3.45 on the morning of May 18th, 2005, when she left her home on Princeton Avenue to go to work at a children's hospital, where she was employed as a cook. She had been working at the hospital for around seven years and was popular and well-liked by her colleagues. The executive chef at her workplace said Nancy would go above and beyond what was needed to get the job done. He also described her as having an infectious laugh and that she was upbeat, cheerful, and happy. While the 46-year-old was not scheduled to start until 5 a.m., she always liked to arrive with plenty of time to spare. However, Nancy never arrived at work. While on her way, she reportedly called one of her brothers and told him that she had a flat tire and that she needed his help to repair it. But when her brother arrived, there was no sign of the 46-year-old or her vehicle. One of Nancy's siblings later reported that her tires had been newly fitted and they didn't believe she would have gotten a flat already. A few days later, on May 22nd, Nancy's blue 2001 Chevrolet S10 pickup truck with Alabama license plate number YOBOS was found abandoned at a pilot gas station on Bankhead Highway in Midfield, Alabama. Once again, 
there was no sign of the 46-year-old, although witnesses saw a man driving the truck some time after Nancy went missing. The truck's tires were intact, and her spare was still in place. Due to the lack of information available in the case, there is some confusion about whether or not Nancy called her brother. This idea was reported by one of her co-workers, who called her when she noticed she was running late. Apparently, Nancy told this co-worker that she had a flat tire and was waiting on her brother. Early reports of the disappearance claim that her brother received the call, but later reports from 2012 quote her brother James as saying, she had supposedly called me, but I never received a phone call from her. It is unclear where the information then came from that James arrived on the scene, but found his sister and her vehicle missing. Interestingly, Nancy is known to have always kept her car doors locked and her gas tank full. After Nancy vanished, friends and family began canvassing the local neighborhoods and appeared on radio stations in an attempt to spread awareness about her sudden and uncharacteristic disappearance. Meanwhile, law enforcement officers made and released a composite sketch of the man seen in her truck. A Tuscaloosa businessman offered $22,000 as a reward for any information leading to Nancy's whereabouts or her abductor, but this brought the case no further forward. The 46-year-old's roommate, Grethel Pryor, who worked at a different hospital to Nancy, was an early riser too, and last saw her that morning. She noted that Nancy always warmed up both of their cars before she left for work, and she was last seen backing out of the driveway as Grethel unplugged the iron that morning. A web sleuthed user identifying themselves as Nancy's sister-in-law has stated her family's belief that Grethel knows more than she's letting on, and alleges that the pair had a fight the day before Nancy disappeared. The lack of information in this case, however, makes it difficult to come to a solid conclusion. There have been two persons of interest in Nancy's case. One is a woman named Penny L. Clark, who was 35 at the time of the disappearance. She was a resident of Bessemer, Alabama, and her fingerprints were found on the truck. Although police wished to speak with her, it appears that they have never located her and she has never come forward. In a similar fashion, the other person of interest is a man named John Dubose, who was jailed on unrelated charges after Nancy went missing, but was released in 2010. According to a 2012 news article, Dubose gave law enforcement information about the 46-year-old's truck, which they felt made him someone worth speaking to further. However, his whereabouts have never been discovered. Nancy's case is still unsolved and has received very little media coverage over the years. One detective on the case reported that they received a lot of rumors and very few leads when tips were called in initially. Nancy Lewis was last seen on Princeton Avenue in Birmingham, Alabama, on May 18th, 2005. She was an African-American female aged 46 and standing at five foot six. She had graying black hair, brown eyes and pierced ears and weighed 160 pounds when last seen. She is a diabetic, but controlled her condition with her diet rather than medication. If she is still alive, she will be 62 years old. If you have any information about Nancy's case, you can call Alabama Crime Stoppers on 205-254-7777. John Leonard. Our penultimate case this month comes from Monroe County, Pennsylvania, a location which was chosen by our patron, Matt. Home to almost 170,000 citizens, Monroe County has grown exponentially in the last few decades due to a rise in tourism and has seen a massive boost in population. But lingering beneath the surface is one of Pennsylvania's most baffling, decades-old cold cases. John Leonard Sr. was described by those who knew him as a quiet, hard-working family man. Although born in Westover, John was raised in Elmhurst, West Virginia by his Catholic, Irish parents. He enlisted in the army in 1942 while working as a crane operator at the age of 24 and served with the US Army Air Corps in Europe during World War II, where he eventually spent 22 months being held as a prisoner of war. Upon his return back home, John worked various odd jobs before finally landing himself a job as a cab driver, mechanic, and bartender with Mick Motors, 
a family-run company. Between 1954 and 1958, John and his wife, Madeline Merrill Leonard, had five children, three sons and twin girls, but eventually separated. One of his daughters, Laurie, has told news outlets that her father was strict but loving. He taught his two girls how to cook and did whatever he could to help out with friends, family, and neighbors. Laurie also remembers how their father would sometimes take them along on cab rides and even occasionally drove them around in a limo that Mix had for their business. At the time of his murder in 1970, he was 52 years old and living in an apartment above Mick Motors with his five children, whom he had full custody over. Madeline, by this time, had moved to Maine. On Tuesday, September 8th, 1970, John was chatting with his daughters about their need for new school uniforms. Money was tight, but the father of five always tried to do right by his family. The conversation was interrupted by the phone ringing at 2.40 p.m. A customer needed a ride from Buck Hill Falls Inn, which was about two miles away from John's apartment. He immediately left to pick up the customer and last radioed his employer, Donald Mick, at 2.44 p.m. At 2.50 p.m., an employee of the inn and part-time police officer named David Schaller saw John's vehicle, a black 1966 Plymouth sedan, pull up on the driveway, facing towards the main building of the inn. Schaller watched as a man approached the car. The man was later described to investigators as being white, with dark hair and dark-colored horn-rimmed glasses, while wearing dark trousers and a teal windbreaker. He was also carrying a bag from a regional department store named Globe Store. There are mixed reports about the man's age, however, with some statements putting him in his early 20s, while others placing him between the ages of 30 and 40. An hour later, at 3.45 p.m., Donald Mick became concerned when he hadn't heard back from John, and so he went to the inn to investigate. It was here that he came across the Plymouth sedan, parked 150 feet from the entrance. John Leonard Sr. was inside the vehicle, dead, slumped over the steering wheel. He had been shot four times in the back of the head. Retired police chief Bob Labar was the first one to arrive on the scene, and he cordoned off the area, even getting into a confrontation with a few civilians who tried to get too close to the vehicle. The civilians are not linked to the crime. They appear to have just been fascinated by the commotion, especially since the area was so rural and quiet. After this, the Pennsylvania State Police arrived and took over the scene and the investigation. Led by Detective Michael Dean, they arrived at 5.45 p.m. on the day of the crime, taking photos and impounding John's car for fingerprints and testing. However, they ultimately found no conclusive evidence other than that the 52-year-old had been shot with a small caliber gun. There were no missing cab fare receipts either, suggesting that the motive had not been robbery. The man in the teal windbreaker, who was seen by part-time officer David Schaller, has never been identified. It is unknown if he was the perpetrator or customer, or whether or not he was related to the crime in any way. He has never come forward. John's case quickly came to a standstill when leads dried up in the months following his murder. There have never been any suspects nor persons of interest in his case. John was not a gambler, had no known enemies, did not owe anybody money, and was not known to participate in criminal activities. But the story doesn't end there. Following John's demise, his estranged wife Madeline returned from Maine to care for their children. A few years later, on February 21st, 1973, she told the children that she had a possible lead in John's case and had somewhere to go. She refused to tell them where she was going, what that lead was, or where it had come from, and declined to take any of the children along with her. She told them she'd be back shortly and left the house. The following morning, 48-year-old Madeline was found dead in her car that had apparently veered off the road and crashed into the woods off Pennsylvania Route 940, east of Mount Pocono in the Paradise Township. The incident was ruled as an accident. There have been few theories in John's case, the main suggestion is that his murder was a professional hired hit, given how quick and clean it appeared to be. Online sleuths have wondered if Madeline was responsible, but wanted to come clean about it and was killed to stop her from telling the truth. 
However, this is generally considered a possibility only because there's really no one else in John's life that we know of who may hold animosity toward him. John's murder shook the community where he lived. Bob Labar recalled it was, quote, The first time I can remember when people in this community started locking their doors and carrying guns for protection. He added that, at the time, homicide in the area was basically unheard of. As of 2021, John's case is still unsolved. His twin daughters, Laurie and Deborah, continue to look for answers, and one of his sons, Kevin, is still alive. Unfortunately, in the years since John's death, his other two sons have passed away, John Leonard Jr., who was 39, and Timothy Leonard, who was 57. If you have any information about John's death, you can call the authorities on 570-619-6480. Cindy Ball. Our final case location this month comes from our patron Todd, who chose the city of Parkersburg, West Virginia. With over 30,000 residents, Parkersburg is known for its historical sites and tourist attractions, including nature parks and a variety of five-star restaurants. Looking closer, however, we were able to find one of its most notorious unsolved cases. 36-year-old Cindy Ball was last seen on the evening of October 22nd, 2014, leaving the Overtime Sports Bar on Emerson Avenue. A seemingly bright and happy young woman, Cindy had grown up in nearby Vienna, graduating from high school there. She had no reason to disappear, which meant her friends and family were greatly concerned when she didn't contact anybody on the night of the 22nd, nor the following day. With no one able to get a hold of her, Cindy's brother took the matter to the police and filed a missing persons report on October 23rd. His sister's vehicle was soon located outside the bar in which she was last seen, her handbag still inside. More concerningly still, the authorities were made aware of several Facebook posts on the 36-year-old's page, where she discussed having her car broken into and all four of its tires slashed. She noted in the post that she knew who was responsible for the vandalism. Two days later, hunters out in the woods came across what they thought was a deer carcass nestled in high grass on an embankment near Sugar Camp Road. Upon closer inspection, however, the men realized this was the remains of a woman, and they promptly phoned emergency services. Cindy's body was initially identified on the scene with the use of a photograph, with the identification later reaffirmed by her family. Cindy had been shot in the back of the head once. Authorities believe that the young woman was killed elsewhere and that the location where her body was found was simply a dumping ground. There was no physical evidence at the scene which indicated that she had been shot there. While investigators have a suspect in Cindy's case, there have been no arrests or charges brought in the seven years since her murder. Speaking with the media, detectives have emphasized that they need the case to be watertight with no loose ends before they consider bringing charges against someone. Additionally, they have told news outlets that they believe a second person is involved who likely assisted in the moving of the body. Once more, they have someone in mind for this, but a lack of cooperation from their main suspects has left the case cold. It has been made clear that the suspect for her murder is someone that Cindy knew, although they have never been identified publicly. Law enforcement have also stated that they don't believe the vandalism to Cindy's car is linked to her murder. At the moment, it appears that the case is at a standstill until more evidence comes to light or witnesses come forward. It is generally believed that fear and a distrust of the police is stopping people from speaking with law enforcement. If you have any information about Cindy Ball's murder, you can contact the West Virginia Crime Stoppers on 304-255-7867. And there you have the facts. Thank you to all our patron supporters and congratulations to this month's winners. If you'd like to see your hometown featured, please check out our Patreon by following the link below. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.